program contains mature subject matter. Viewer discretion is advised. At first it sounded crazy. A human foot had been mailed to Conservative Party headquarters. His torso was found stuffed in a suitcase on a... The suspect is a 29-year-old model and self-styled porn actor named Luca Rocco Magnotta. The most we know about Luca Magnotta comes from the digital trail he created of himself. Police agencies around the world are circulating photos of Luca Magnotta. Magnotta is wanted for the gruesome murder and dismemberment of 33-year-old Jun Lin. He was spotted, questioned, and then arrested, ending a feverish manhunt that has made headlines around the world. This is where the hunt for Luca Magnotta ended. When police finally arrested him, he was looking at pictures of himself on the Internet. Tonight you'll hear from people who knew Magnotta. Their stories have never been told on TV before. I mean, I knew he had problems. I mean, it showed. In my heart of hearts, I knew it was Luca within the first 30 seconds of the video. Someone had to pay attention to him every moment of every day. It was a, it was a drug for him. It was a painfully public story and a deeply personal story, and much of it played out in a virtual world. Good evening, I'm Mark Kelly and welcome to the Fifth Estate. The story of Luca Magnotta isn't an easy one to tell, but it is an important one to learn. We were all shocked when we heard the lurid details of the murder of Jun Lin, a crime Magnotta has been charged with, a charge he has pleaded not guilty to. But a group of online investigators had been monitoring Magnotta for 18 months leading up to his arrest, observing his disturbing behavior, warning authorities repeatedly that he was a danger to society. Tonight, you'll meet them and hear what they uncovered during their investigation, the missed opportunities and the lessons they learned hunting Magnotta. It's May 2012 in a sparse apartment in Montreal. 29-year-old Luca Magnotta is spending hours alone and online, a virtual shut-in, desperately looking for fame and recognition. Police say it was in his apartment that he planned and executed a bold and bloody attack, then videotaped it for the world to see. But what would push anyone to do this? And how did he go from internet wannabe to the object of an international manhunt? And why would anyone go this far to get our attention? Magnata was born Eric Clinton Newman in 1982. He grew up in Scarborough, east of Toronto, the eldest of three. His parents split when Eric was young. In his online postings, he wrote that growing up, he was close to his grandmother Phyllis. He says he was homeschooled because he was told the world was a dirty and dangerous place. But he went from one broken home to another when his grandparents' marriage also ended in divorce. His mother now had a new boyfriend. Eric described him as a monster. As for his father, the two had now drifted far apart. The only bright light in his family life was his sister Melissa, one of the few people beyond himself he would ever describe as beautiful. His family life in shambles, he wrote there was no relief at high school, where he said he was an outcast. So what do his classmates remember? Well, for someone who would go on to be so notorious, they say he didn't act out or stand out. He was, in short, forgettable. By the time he was 22, there wasn't a whole lot to know about Eric Newman. But we now know he was struggling with depression. He underwent a psychiatric assessment and was prescribed medication for life. And that would play a part in what happened next. In 2004, he befriended a 21-year-old girl online. She had the mental capacity of an 8 to 12-year-old. He used her credit cards to rack up thousands in unpaid bills. But police say he didn't stop there. They allege he also sexually assaulted the woman and videotaped it. His name, his Newman's lawyer was Peter Scully. 
Was that a concern of yours when you initially took this case, that this guy was preying on a mentally disabled woman? Definitely. Compared to the fraud charges, uh, the sexual assault allegation was infinitely more problematic. Then something unexpected happened. Before the trial even started, the Crown dropped the sexual assault charge against his client. Now, looking back, Scully is unsettled by that decision. Had he been convicted of that, what impact would that have on his life? Huge. How so? Well, he would have been uh, on the sexual offender uh, monitoring, uh, which means he's, uh, he has to report to uh, officers supervising him, and probably for life. So the decision not to pursue those charges changed his life immeasurably? Immeasurably. With huge ramifications to our society eventually. Newman was convicted of the fraud charges. The judge, aware of his psychiatric assessment, warned him, you have a medical problem and you need to always take medication. If you do not, your life is going to get messed up. After years of turmoil, with few prospects for the future, Eric Newman needed to reinvent himself. In 2006, he legally changed his name to Luca Rocco Magnotta. He began a transformation that led him to Toronto's gay community, where he met Barbie, a transgendered woman who would become his girlfriend. Changing his name was easy, changing who he was, much harder. I mean, I knew he had problems. I mean, it showed, you know, huh. when I was with him. It just, just his body language, the stuff he would do sometimes. Um, it's just, a, you know, in his character, you could just... His mannerisms. But Magnato was a master of self-promotion. He marketed himself as a model and a high-flying escort. He appeared in a handful of porn movies, no stage too small for his ambitions. I'm a swimmer, so... Well, myself in shape. Yeah. What's it been like for you becoming an escort? Do you enjoy your work? Yeah, you know, I really do enjoy my work. Um, I get to meet new people and... Uh, <laughs> all the time and uh, you know I'm, I'm a people person and uh, you know it just worked out great for me you know. <laughs> he basked in the attention he received on the internet show Naked oh, News. You know what the best part is? The best part about being an escort is um, I'm my own boss. I get to pick my own hours and make a lot of money. <laughs> he said he wanted to be famous one day. I mean that was his dream. He said one day I'm gonna be famous. Everything he did, an attempt to build the legend of Luca Magnotta. He was just really into himself, with, you know, with the photos, with me. He would always beg me, taking pictures of him on his digital camera, right? It was all about him and the relationship when I was with him. And what was his image? Or what did he want his image to be? Uh, beauty. He wanted beauty, perfection. He wanted to just stay youthful looking. You know, I've had my nose done. I've had uh, two hair transplants, like I said before, and I'm planning on doing muscle implants in my pecs and my arms. So that just remains to be seen, but because that's pretty. You think you're a bit of an addict? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my name's Luca, and I'm a cosmetic surgery addict. Magnato was developing a pathological need to get noticed. And what better platform than auditioning for a reality TV show called Plastic Makes Perfect? A little before and after. How important are your looks to you? Oh my God, if, that's number one. Okay, number one is looks. Number two would have to be intelligence. And I don't know what the rest are. <laughs> all, I do, all I care about is number one, basically. All I do is... The producers took one look and rejected him. Hi, my name is Luca. Magnot is my last name. M-A-G-N-O-T-T-A. But for every exhibitionist, there's another reality TV show waiting in the wings. This was his audition for a role as an underwear model on the show Cover Guy. A lot of people tell me I'm really devastatingly good looking, so... Well, the judges didn't see him that way. Once again, he was told he didn't have what it takes to make it on TV. Once again, he was rejected. At this point, Magnata was starved for attention and a man he was about to meet was prepared to give it to him. Well, 
he walked as if he was on a stage or as if he was on a ramp for modeling clothes. He, he walked a very special way and was always watching his posture. I just thought, I've never met anybody like this before. Henry, a successful professional, isn't his real name. He asked for his identity to be hidden because he feels his friendship with Magnata would ruin his reputation. The two traveled together, and Henry, a gay man, was eager to get closer to his young friend. He says despite Magnata's lust for the camera lens, he shied away from any intimacy. Just somebody who continually said, I have a private life and I don't share it with anybody. That was, well, there was a wall and I didn't try to get through it because I just thought he made it pretty clear that there was, a, well, I couldn't get any closer. No, no closer. That's all. Despite his best efforts, Magnata was bankrupt. His professional life as empty as his personal life. There were no more movie offers, no more TV auditions. His interests were now getting darker with a growing fixation for serial killers. Well, I heard stories about him online, about him dating Carl Hamoka. But I knew that was all lies, you know? I mean, I, I knew he made that up himself because he was, you know, very fascinated by her and Paul Bernardo. So he wanted to link his name to her. It's almost like an obsessed fan, you know? Why I, uh, uh, I guess obsession, right? Magnata even went so far as to create this tribute video to Carla Homolka, suggesting they had a life together. Though, if you take a closer look, the blonde woman he's sitting with here, that's actually his mother. Now, after creating the rumors he was involved with Homolka, the master of self-promotion contacted the press to deny them. I, I'm about to have a nervous breakdown here. My reputation is completely ruined. Um, I just uh, want everybody to set, I want to set the record straight that um, me and her have absolutely no connection. It created a minor stir, but Magnata needed something bigger and bolder, and he knew exactly what to do. He was in search of attention, and he was about to get it, big time. It's the fall of 2010. Luca Magnata has spent years feeding his seemingly insatiable appetite for attention. But after all the reality TV auditions, the plastic surgery, and the online myth-making, he was still hungry for more. And he got his inspiration from the darkest corners of the Internet. On Magnata's Facebook page, he posted a link to a video called Three Guys, One Hammer. The video is appalling, revealing a man being savagely beaten to death. Made by a group of teenage killers, the video was a sensation for the legions of blood seekers who troll the web. Then, shortly before Christmas, someone was hyping a video on message boards. The video was called, One Boy, Two Kittens. It depicts an unidentified man placing two kittens in a sealed bag, then sucking out the air with a vacuum. The camera lingers while the kittens slowly suffocate. In the online world, where images of unspeakable violence are just a click away, it might seem strange, but there is an unwritten rule. There's an internet subculture that firmly believes that you never, ever mess with cats. So minutes after the video appeared, the outrage went viral. I don't think I've ever had a reaction like that to something like that before that was so intense because it was just... Uh, It wasn't normal. Ryan Boyle, a former U.S. soldier with the online name Save Kitty, went on the offensive. He formed a Facebook group. 4,000 people signed on overnight. These were not people that were being paid money. They weren't doing it for the fame. 
They weren't doing it for recognition. They were doing it. We all had the same thing in mind. We wanted to catch this guy. And everyone was volunteering their own time, their own effort, uh, uh, taking time away from their families to come in here, uh, mostly anonymously, to help with this one thing. The vacuum kitten killer, as he was now known on the internet, then released two more videos and photos 24 hours after the original. The identity of the killer still concealed. The online investigators felt he was taunting them. There was something about the way he did this. He loved on these cats. He pet them, he snuggled with them, and then he murdered them. This guy that's doing this, or this girl, we didn't know at the time, that's doing this is is a vile human being and needs to, this needs to stop. Her online name is Body Movin'. She's one of 11 members of a group called the Animal Beta Project. The activists target animal abusers online. She wanted her identity protected because she fears retribution from the people she hunts. We all are justice seekers. We're all right seekers, you know. Uh, we all want to, we're all tired of being I don't know how to say this. We're all tired of being pushed around by people who say this is acceptable behavior. Um, it's not acceptable behavior to film yourself hurting an animal and uploading it for fun or profit. John Green, also an alias, joined the group, convinced the vacuum kitten killer video was just a dress rehearsal for something much worse. What did you feel was at stake? We felt he would continue, that we, he would harm other animals, and eventually move on to something even more violent, hurting a person. The amateur sleuths began the arduous task of deconstructing the video, frame by frame, looking for any clues that might reveal the identity and the location of the kitten killer. And then, a major breakthrough. These photos were planted on a website. Same kittens, same apartment as the video, but the face of the killer was no longer blurred. Ryan Boyle, the former soldier, now believes they came from Magnata. The question is, had Magnata drawn attention to himself just to get attention? Yeah, he did. That was the whole purpose. But see, the question is, if he had wanted to be known, then why did he do something that was going to send him to jail, where he will never be heard from again? I don't understand. Was he crazy? He was crazy. Four days later, another clue, hand delivered once again, they believe, by Magnata. The name of the kitten vacuumer you're looking for is Luca Magnata. He was born in Russia, lives in Los Angeles, and has lived in several different countries. The apartment in the video is located in West Hollywood. Hope this helps. I'm 100% serious. While Magnata revealed his name and his face, he continued to cloak his location, keeping himself safe from the possibility of legal prosecution. So the amateur investigators googled his name to try to find him, and even they were overwhelmed by what they discovered. We started doing research and we had to stop and saying, is this real? Are we imagining this or is this, it's too surreal, this can't be happening. And we had to take a step back and say, Let's look at this from an objective mode. Is this real? What was surreal? What? Everything on the internet about him. Magnata's carnivorous narcissism exploded before their eyes. All his multiple looks and identities designed to both promote and protect. They read him boast of his ties to serial killers and the Russian mob. They read how he said he was persecuted because of his white supremacist sympathies and they marveled at his imagined celebrity as a model and porn star. Luca is the Prince of Canada, writes one fan, likely Magnata. He's a god here. If you have 50 different blogs and a, a whole bunch of YouTube profiles and MySpace profiles and I can't even name, I mean, it seems like every day they're finding new totally do new different websites that he purportedly created. You've got to spend a lot of time on the internet.
Paris. Had a house in Paris. Had a house in Paris, Miami, oh. Boston. I mean, eh. there's pictures of him with sports cars, yeah. making it look like he lives this glamorous lifestyle. But hundreds of Facebook profiles and pages and groups. But finding him wouldn't be easy. Magnata made himself a citizen of the world. There he was in Los Angeles, driving a fancy car, or sitting in a hot tub surrounded by friends, or another at some exotic beach location. They're all photoshopped. They're all photoshopped. We found the images that you're speaking of. I know him in Miami, in front of the Miami sign, and he's sitting there looking cool. That's not him. That's actually somebody else, and he put his head on that person's body. You know, he says that he's in Russia, he says he's in Miami, he says he's in Los Angeles, he says he's in, you know, all these New York. It's all at the same time, and nobody can do that. Nobody can be in five different places at the same day. They were determined to find him and stop him, and they got the break they needed when they came across this seemingly innocuous picture. They knew digital pictures contain invisible data, bits of stored information embedded in the photos. Using that, the online investigators could determine details about the make, model, even the color of Magnata's camera. Pink, by the way. They could also determine when and where some of the pictures were taken. This picture was taken on a cell phone and stamped with a GPS location. Turned out, Magnata was in Toronto. The Toronto Eaton Center. So, that's late October, okay? The images from the kittens were taken on November 28th. Now that they knew where he was, they contacted the Ontario SPCA with an urgent request. Like, this is it. We got a name, we got a location. Give it to police, they'll handle it from here. An inspector with the OSPCA, Brad Dewar, says a file was opened on Magnata in January 2011, and it was treated as a priority. Certainly, um, past history um, has proven that uh, acts of cruelty will accelerate to acts of cruelty to um, children and to adults. You've seen that? You've seen that link? That, that link has been proven by uh, the FBI. Dewar says the OSBCA was now working with the Toronto Police and the RCMP to find Magnata. The information that we had was that he was in Toronto, but if he was bunking with someone or living somewhere else, there was no fixed address with his name on it. So you're telling me here that there was no way, if he was living in Toronto as we know, there was no way to find him with whatever resources you had or the Toronto Police Service, the RCMP, whoever else that you've reached out to? With all these agencies together, no one could find him in the city of Toronto? Not at that point, no. Really? And in our minds, it's like, how, why is it so difficult to find this person? You know, all they have to do is go to their system, type in a name and find him. It, it, it boggled us at yeah, times. Yeah, we didn't understand. How, how can this person get around so freely and not be found? The Toronto police had been contacted in February 2011. Now, eight months later, Magnata hadn't been found, hadn't been questioned. The online investigators warned police he was an animal abuser, a public danger. But you can imagine in a big city like Toronto, questioning an alleged online kitten killer probably wasn't a priority. Magnata's pursuers had backed off for now, but he was about to get their attention again. I got a message from somebody saying, uh, you might want to look at this video. He sent a link to me and my heart literally sank. All that we had done, everything that we had done was for nothing. Here he is doing it again. The new videos were posted in November and December of 2011, a year after the vacuum killings. In one, an unidentified man wearing a Santa hat feeds a live kitten to a python. In the other, a kitten is duct taped to a broom handle, then drowned in a bathtub. I knew it was Luca. I mean, in my heart of hearts, I knew it was Luca within the first 30 seconds of the video. It felt like he was, he's waving mm -hmm. it, sticking Text our noses in it. He was basically saying, Look, I've done it again. You're not going to catch me. It was July 2011 in Montreal. And a young man had just arrived, following his dream to go to university here. 
Junlin had grown up in rural China. Now he was the great hope of his family. He was pursuing a degree in computer science at Concordia University. Once he graduated, he planned to support his parents and younger sister with his new career. Lin was 33 years old, but his mother still worried about him living in a big foreign city. So he'd walk the streets with his cell phone and stream images back to her. His message to her in their daily conversations was always the same. Don't worry, he told her. I'm safe. I do, I got a great view of my condo other than this bitch keeps complaining about me. But where was Luca Magnata? He'd left Toronto, planting a story claiming he'd fled to Russia. Still, his pursuers hadn't given up finding him. We felt like we were always one step behind him. Eventually he's going to make a mistake and he's going to give us a piece of information that's going to give us exactly where he's at. That was to us the one piece of information we didn't have an exact address. Your help is needed. The team of internet experts had now spent a year analyzing Magnata's online footprint. They released this video to the internet, illustrating his kaleidoscope of identities. The video, a worldwide alert asking for help in bringing him to justice. The question, where in the world was he? We need your help. Luca also goes by the name Eric Clinton, Kirk Newman and Vladimir Romino, as well as hundreds of other aliases. Magnata was making news in London. This headline in the UK Sun on December 3rd last year urged people to help catch the sicko. Two days later, who but Magnata himself would walk into the Sun's office to deny any link to the videos. Why would you, you write? Sun reporter Alex West confronted Magnata. Um, you can pretend to be someone you're not on the internet. People frame me, so isn't that logical to try to defend myself? Think about that. But they're not. But that, but that does make sense. Not, they're not it? pretending not to be someone me. they're not. You're not answering. But they're not pretending to be someone they're not. not. Well, they're pretending to be me. People are pretending to be you. Isn't that obvious? Two days later, the Sun received this email, believed to be from Magnata. It's fun watching people work so hard gathering all the evidence and then not being able to name me or catch me. You see, I always win. I always hold the trump card, and I will continue to make more movies. Next time you hear from me, it will be in a movie I'm producing that will have some humans in it, not just pussies. The London police were notified. They said it was out of their jurisdiction. So he slipped out of the UK and disappeared back into his virtual world. Those who were looking for him knew police weren't going to spend their time building a case against a suspected cat killer. They knew they had to tighten the noose, and they knew they had to do it themselves. I think our biggest frustration was getting people to believe us. Ryan Boyle, the former soldier now commanding a Facebook army of 4,000 people looking for Magnata, knew they needed hard evidence. No one really cared. Uh, we had a lot of trouble getting help from anybody so the way we felt about it was well we just needed to build the case stronger we had to make it and and that was really that was sort of our goal was we wanted to make a case that was so rock solid it was impossible to ignore so the animal activists produced a CSI like video laying out their case against Magnata the proof Magnata and the kitten killer were one and the same they asserted was right in front of our eyes the furniture in the videos matched the furniture in Magnata's personal photos. They matched the animals he killed with ones he posed with. They pointed out the similarities in the clothing the killer wore and the clothes Magnata wore. And look, this chair seen in the Python video appears in pictures posted on Magnata's own website. Please remember this face. Brad Dewar of the Ontario SPCA conceded the case against Magnata was mounting, but without a suspect to question, what could be done? Our goal at that point is to confirm those details. So it's great that those details came forward, but now as an officer who's investigating the case, we have to confirm that. And that's why we needed to 
further the investigation with police services to try to locate this person and, and try to find out where they are so that we can uh, confirm those details. While Magnata had a sweeping presence online, in the real world, he was like a specter. No credit cards, no paper trail. Ironically, he seemed to glide through life unnoticed. <laughs> the online investigators were now learning more about his lies designed to throw them off. For example, in the vacuum video, a voice can be heard in the background speaking Russian. A clue, perhaps, the video was made in Russia. But they traced the voice back to a Russian TV series. Magnata had recorded the audio and inserted it in the video. He also posted an Arizona phone number from one of his known alias accounts, claiming he was moving there to open a business. But as his pursuers tracked Magnata, it appeared he was also tracking them. And to make sure they knew, he posted details about their private lives. If you were trying to size him up, you are trying to figure him out, you can imagine he was probably trying to figure you guys oh, out absolutely. as well. Yeah, he's mentioned us, he's mentioned my name mm -hmm. several times, he, yeah. would, he would name certain pictures that he would send us with some of our profile names. It was. It was so it was this back and forth between us but we knew we we knew we knew more about him than he would ever know about us magnata would even send them this not so subtle message connected to the opening animation of the steven spielberg film catch me if you can but the online investigators knew he would slip up sooner or later and then a tip magnata may be in montreal so they began to go through their archives of pictures looking for any that might place him there. This photo attracted their attention because of the unique street lights. And they're very they have ornamental, they're very kind of ornamental to them and you know that's specific to a city. So also the light poles were very unique. They were straight and then rounded very slightly and they looked unique to, to me. So there's just, you take pieces of you take that photo and you look for things that he can't manipulate that's there you look for a landmark and you just start going to Google Maps looking for those street lights all we would do is we'd go to Google Maps go to us intersection go to the street view and look at the lamp the light poles and the street lights if it wasn't that we moved on to the next city and so we started looking in Montreal Said, well, here we go, black poles, black street lights. This seems to be the area, and basically what we do is we just take like a grid pattern. You go here and you start looking for this location. They found the exact intersection in Montreal. They tracked him down, and now they were closing in. Where did you think he was going next? You're trying to anticipate his every move. I remember specifically posting in our little secret group, Somebody has to do something, and I don't know what some, that somebody is, but this is getting out of control. He's threatening to kill people. What's up and hi to all my fans? It's hard to pinpoint what was fueling Luca Magnata's desire for fame and recognition. I just did what else you want me to say. Did it start when he was Eric Newman, the sad kid from Scarborough? Was his narcissism a way to mask his personal and professional failures and his struggle with mental illness? It's hard to say where it started, but soon people around the world would know his name. It was spring 2012, and Jun Lin, the exchange student from China, was settling into his home in Montreal. He'd send pictures back to his mother, expressing the joy he'd found in his new life here. This is the last one he sent, a simple park in his neighborhood. Isn't it beautiful, he wrote. 5720 Carey Boulevard, apartment 208. Luca Magnata had just moved here. The lives of these two men were about to intersect.
Your help is needed to locate Luca Magnata. This individual In April, a video is posted on the web urging people to join a Facebook group to find the quote serial killer. It's believed Magnata made this video and issued this warning. Do not approach Luca Magnata. He is a dangerous psychopath. The online investigators felt they were closing in. That spent 18 months on his trail ever since he made his first kitten video. Now they were sure he was in Montreal. They sent that information to the Toronto Police and Brad Dewar at the Ontario SPCA. We immediately reached out to the SPCA in Montreal and uh, Montreal Police Services to identify that uh, we had this concern with this individual and we were seeking some help. Was that good enough, in your opinion, for something to be done? It was certainly enough information was provided to raise the alarm and to continue to question, to ascertain this person and, and to speak to them, uh, to make contact. There's enough information to make contact. Did any SPCA official, did any police official speak to this guy through this timeline now where we're getting to more than a year, year and a half? Not that I'm aware of. So the online investigators contacted the Montreal police themselves, telling them Magnata was a threat. But to Montreal police, Magnata was a nobody. They had no file on him. There was no warrant for his arrest. In short, they said there was nothing they could do. So the investigators spoke with the Montreal SPCA and urged them to contact a Crown prosecutor to get a warrant. The contact was made. The request for a warrant denied. It seemed the evidence coming from the virtual world just wasn't enough. All of our information, all of our evidence was gained from the internet, so to them it was internet-based flu fla flim flam, you know, they didn't care until he killed a person. And then it was all of a sudden it was, oh my gosh, we gotta go find this guy. Well, that's what we've been telling you all along. The online investigators believe Magnata then started to hype a new video. Remember in that email to the British newspaper, he promised his next movie would have humans in it. First, a picture was posted with someone in a purple hoodie clenching an ice pick, promoting one lunatic, one ice pick. I hear it's pretty disturbing, someone writes. Then, on another site, someone, likely Magnata, asked, where can I watch the one lunatic, one ice pick video? I've been trying to find it for weeks. There's another posting on a discussion board again believed to be by Magnata, that asked, I'm just curious to know what you guys think about people who film their crimes. Now it's important to note, there was no evidence the video even existed yet. But Ryan Boyle felt it was only a matter of time, and he was powerless to stop it. It was exactly the same. He used the same exact method to to submit his video. He promoted it, he talked about it, he gave it a name. A week later on May 24th, Junlin failed to show up for work. His friends were worried. One would even call his mother in China asking if she had heard from her son. She hadn't. She said she had a bad feeling. That same day on this website, someone, likely Magnata, posts this cryptic profile. Luca Magnata is an extremely dangerous and sick psychopath. He's incapable of feeling remorse. Psychopaths can appear very charming and look beautiful, but beware. They are cunning and highly maniacal. Attached to the profile was a series of links to all the news stories about the search for the kitten killer posted with pride. The next day, May 25th, one lunatic, one ice pick appeared on the web. It depicts a man bound on a bed. At first he's alive, then there's an edit. Now it's clear the man is dead. The video lasts 11 amoral minutes. Someone stabs the corpse repeatedly with an ice pick, then dismembers the body with a knife. Four days later, a janitor discovered a torso in a suitcase. It was Jun Lin. Police would finally knock on Luca Magnata's door, but he was long gone. They discovered an empty apartment soaked in blood. Inside Magnata's apartment, this message was left scrawled on the wall. If you don't like the reflection, 
don't look in the mirror. I don't care. Before he fled the country, Magnata unleashed a torrent of rage online, railing against people who had hurt or disappointed him over his lifetime. He signed them with his ex-girlfriend's name. I just wonder why he would want to drag you into this all these years later. He didn't have much friends, right? So I think I meant something to him, for him to, you know. He lived his life mailing on, online, on the internet. Why is that? Well, I guess most people found him weird, so he felt left out, you know, isolated. Isolated, but with a loyal audience. The online investigators had given him 18 months of their attention. When they heard about Junlin's death, they were torn. Could they have done more, or did they do too much? They continue to ask themselves whether their relentless pursuit of Magnata only fed his pathological desire. You internalize it and you start to blame yourself for things that you shouldn't. You felt some culpability in this? Oh, sure. I mean, I think anybody would. You, you would. Yeah, no. I didn't. I didn't. Maybe I didn't say the right things to the police officer. Maybe I didn't call the right person. Maybe I didn't push hard enough. Maybe I. Maybe yeah. Maybe I didn't push the authorities hard enough to, you know, investigate. You. You blame yourself. He has been associating himself with serial killers way before we even knew him. Did we push him over the edge? No. Probably not. Were we a part of his little act? Yes. But we do want people to know, especially the family members, that there were people out there yeah. trying to stop this person from doing an act like this. Come on. There will be plenty of debate over whether people like Luca Magnata should be ignored or pursued. I don't want to be taped, I'm just watching my show. You stop. But this video illustrates the dilemma. He made it by himself. A man so preoccupied with attention in the mood. that even when he was alone, he played to an audience. Magnata's preliminary hearing is scheduled to get underway in Montreal in March. Of course, we'll be following the story closely. The Fifth Estate returns right after this. That's our program for this week. I'm Mark Kelly. For everyone here at the Fifth Estate, thanks for watching, and we'll see you soon. year old he used her credit cards to rack up thousands in unpaid bills but police say he didn't stop there they allege he also sexually assaulted the woman and videotaped it his name is Doug. Newman's lawyer was Peter Scully was that a concern of yours when you initially took this case that this guy was preying on a mentally disabled woman definitely compared to the fraud charges uh, the sexual assault allegation was infinitely more problematic. Then something unexpected happened. Before the trial even started, the Crown dropped the sexual assault charge against his client. Now, looking back, Scully is unsettled by that decision. Had he been convicted of that, what impact would that have on his life? Huge. How so? Well, he would have been uh, on the sexual offender uh, monitoring, uh, which means he's um, he has to report to uh, officers supervising him and probably for life. So the decision not to pursue those charges changed his life immeasurably. Immeasurably. With huge ramifications to our society eventually. Newman was convicted of the fraud charges. 
The judge, aware of his psychiatric assessment, warned him, you have a medical problem and you need to always take medication. If you do not, your life is going to get messed up. After years of turmoil with Fro, east of Toronto, the eldest of three, his parents split when Eric was young. In his online postings, he wrote that growing up, he was close to his grandmother, Phyllis. He says he was homeschooled because he was told the world was a dirty and dangerous place. But he went from one broken home to another when his grandparents' marriage also ended in divorce. His mother now had a new boyfriend. Eric described him as a monster. As for his father, the two had now drifted far apart. The only bright light in his family life was his sister Melissa, one of the few people beyond himself he would ever describe as beautiful. His family life in shambles, he wrote there was no relief at high school, where he said he was an outcast. So what do his classmates remember? Well, for someone who would go on to be so notorious, they say he didn't act out or stand out. He was, in short, forgettable. By the time he was 22, there wasn't a whole lot to know about Eric Newman. But we now know he was struggling with depression. He underwent a psychiatric assessment and was prescribed medication for life. And that would play a part in what happened next. In 2004, he befriended a 21-year-old girl online. She had the mental capacity of an 8 to 12. The program contains mature subject matter. Viewer discretion is advised. First, it sounded crazy. A human foot had been mailed to Conservative Party headquarters. His torso was found stuffed in a suitcase. On a the suspect is a 29-year-old model and self-styled porn actor named Luca Rocco Magnotta. The most we know about Luca Magnotta comes from the digital trail he created of himself. Police agencies around the world are circulating photos of Luca Magnotta. Magnata is wanted for the gruesome murder and dismemberment of 33-year-old Jun Lin. He was spotted, questioned, and then arrested, ending a feverish manhunt that has made headlines around the world. This is where the hunt for Luca Magnata ended. When police finally arrested him, he was looking at pictures of himself on the internet. Tonight you'll hear from people who knew Magnata. Their stories have never been told on TV before. I mean, I knew he had problems. I mean, it showed. In my heart of hearts, I knew it was Luca within the first 30 seconds of the video. Someone had to pay attention to him every moment of every day. It was a, it was a drug for him. It was a painfully public story and a deeply personal few prospects for the future Eric Newman needed to reinvent himself. In 2006, he legally changed his name to Luca Rocco Magnotta. He began a transformation that led him to Toronto's gay community, where he met Barbie, a transgendered woman who would become his girlfriend. Changing his name was easy, changing who he was, much harder. I mean, I knew he had problems. I mean, it showed, you know, huh. when I was with him. It just. Just his body language, the stuff he would do sometimes. Um, it's just, an, you know, in his character, you could just... His mannerisms. But Magnato was a master of self-promotion. He marketed himself as a model and a high-flying escort. He appeared in a handful of porn movies. No stage too small for his ambitions. I'm a swimmer, so... Well, that's good. Yeah, nice. shape. Yeah. What's it been like for you becoming an escort? Do you enjoy your work? Yeah, you know, I really do enjoy my work. Um, I get to meet new people and, uh, <laughs> all the time, and uh, you know, I'm I'm a people person, and uh, you know, it just worked out great for me. You know. Mm -hmm. He basked in the attention he received on the internet show Naked oh, News. Well, you know what the best part is? The best part about being an escort is uh, I'm my own boss. I get to pick my own hours and make a lot of money. <laughs> he said he wanted to be famous one day. ...story, and much of it played out in a virtual world. 
Good evening. I'm Mark Kelly, and welcome to the Fifth Estate. The story of Luca Magnata isn't an easy one to tell, but it is an important one to learn. We were all shocked when we heard the lurid details of the murder of Jun Lin, a crime Magnata has been charged with, a charge he has pleaded not guilty to. But a group of online investigators had been monitoring Magnata for 18 months leading up to his arrest, observing his disturbing behavior, warning authorities repeatedly that he was a danger to society. Tonight, you'll meet them and hear what they uncovered during their investigation, the missed opportunities and the lessons they learned hunting Magnata. It's May 2012 in a sparse apartment in Montreal. 29-year-old Luca Magnata is spending hours alone and online, a virtual shut-in, desperately looking for fame and recognition. Police say it was in his apartment that he planned and executed a bold and bloody attack, then videotaped it for the world to see. But what would push anyone to do this? And how did he go from internet wannabe to the object of an international manhunt? And why would anyone go this far to get our attention? Magnata was born Eric Clinton Newman in 1982. He grew up in Scarborough.